Well, hello and welcome everybody to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This is the last briefing of 2016. It's been an epic year and we're having a wonderful speaker today, one of my favorite people, Adam Miller, who was one of the key folks on the OpenShift team for many years on the ops side and helping us get um, it up and running and has moved over to Fedora. And he is going to talk to us about the Fedora image builder service today, one of my uh, most anticipated things. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna let Adam introduce himself, take it away. We're gonna have his presentation and then we'll open it up for Q&A afterwards. If you have questions in the chat, post them there. Just remember the speaker can't see the chat while he's talking and demoing. So take it away, Adam. Uh, thank you, Diane. Um, <clears throat> hi, my name is Adam Miller. I work uh, on the Fedora engineering team at Red Hat. I focus uh, primarily on release engineering, tooling, uh, automation, those kinds of things. And what I've been working on most recently is the Docker layered image build service. And uh, we are going to today kind of go through what that is, <clears throat> uh, what that means. But first, I want to do a little bit of background just for anyone who's not uh, completely familiar with all of the lingo and all of the jargon. Um, I want to define what containers are. We'll do a very quick, brief history background, um, just kind of level set and discuss uh, various different things and uh, what Fedora uh, is targeting today and what we will, you know, probably be looking towards in the future in the next uh, year or so as a lot of this stuff um, solidifies out in the, uh, the community ecosystem. Uh, <clears throat> from there, we'll talk about Docker specifically, uh, Docker build um, in in there, we'll actually discuss uh, di various differences between uh, container image, uh, base images, and uh, layered images, and instances of those images, how they become containers, those kinds of things. Uh, I want to quickly define release engineering, uh, just because uh, that will kind of uh, provide perspective around why the system was designed the way it was, and why, the way it is, and, and certain attributes of the system, and, and why they were chosen that way. Uh, and then we'll actually talk directly about the Docker Later image build service, um, the building blocks it was built on top of, um, which is OpenShift, uh, a utility called OSBS, uh, which OSBS client upstream, um, the way that that uh, special, it kind of provides a special use case, a, a pre-prescribed uh, recipe for how to use OpenShift directly, uh, such that you can kind of turn it into a build service. Uh, and while it is limiting in some, way, in some ways because you, you kind of uh, ignore uh, many, many very powerful features of OpenShift, uh, for our spe specific use case, we were able to leverage uh, the, uh, the build component of, of OpenShift very, very well. Uh, and then Koji Container Builds, uh, I'll, I'll kind of briefly discuss that. Uh, for those who are familiar with Koji and Fedora land, it is the uh, canonical source of truth for all things built uh, all artifacts produced by by the Fedora project. Um, and then uh, actually the implementation uh, of Fedora's uh, layered image build service, how it ties together with all of our uh, disparate systems and, and services and things like that within Fedora. And uh, then hopefully I'll have time for a quick demo uh, and Q&A. So um, <clears throat> really quick before we get into containers, uh, if there is anything uh, if there are any questions that pop up, uh, maybe in the chat or otherwise, if uh, um, Diane, I don't know if, if who all on the on the Blue Gene sessions has the ability to interrupt me, but please feel free to interrupt and ask questions if that would uh, prove helpful. It will be uh, so, me. Awesome, wonderful. Feel free to hop in and and, uh, and we'll we'll if there's a dialogue that we can generate, great. Okay, um, <clears throat> so really quick, what are containers? Uh, <clears throat> This is actually something that kind of goes back and forth, uh, depending on who you talk to. But at the end of the day, there is a, a kind of formal definition around operating system level virtualization. This is a concept that's been around for quite some time. And uh, we in the greater Linux community like to call them containers. That has been, um, that has become the de facto standard way of how we actually refer to this thing. Uh, that is more widely known as operating system level virtualization. And it you know has expanded for years. Um, in the past, and, and there's a diagram down here, and, and basically what this shows is how we were able to kind of enable the idea of wrapping up an application and its libraries, um, as well as uh, just kind of its runtime context, uh, and, and decouple it 
uh, loosely from the operating system, the host OS and the hardware and those kinds of things. And, uh, and that, is, that is what we are able to do. So uh, the, con the concept's not new, uh, and I, I pose to argue, and, and there are a few others out in the community who pose to argue this, uh, that the original container was the Chirrut. Uh, if anybody's familiar with um, uh, Brian Cantrell, a uh, great speaker, uh, you know, has a, a huge lineage in Solaris and all those kinds of things, and uh, nowadays uh, Lumos. But um, <clears throat> he has a great talk that kind of echoes some of this and, and has very interesting citations back into the history of computer science. But basically, the idea of, of lying to a, a program uh, about its reality uh, such that you can have a context uh, of, or uh, you can have an inst instantiation of that program in a runtime thread and the context of the world around it is different than the reality of the system below it. And, you know, it's a root, it's very primitive. You basically just say, this is, this is your root file system, even though it's not actually the root file system of the system uh, that it's, it's running on top of. Um, and it lacks many sophisticated features that we get later in life, uh, copy and write file systems, quota enforcement, rate limiting, um, any kind of constraint for uh, resources and, uh, and those kinds of things. So <clears throat> just really quick for those who aren't familiar, um, FreeBSD uh, had a more sophisticated technology uh, called Jails. Then uh, there was Linux vServer, server, Slayer Zones, OpenBZ, LXC. Uh, both Linux uh, vServer and uh, OpenBZ, while they were running on Linux, uh, they never made it uh, in, in main ups. They never made it upstream uh, and never made it in, in wide adoption. LXC is where things got really interesting. <clears throat> and for those not familiar, LXC stands for um, Linux containers. Uh, and because acronyms are fun, uh, there's not actually a third word. It's just the end of the word Linux. And it's basically just a, a user space set of tools that would wrap uh, kernel namespacing and C group. So these were things that were provided by the kernel. And uh, the, a couple of years leading up to 2008, it, these capabilities were implemented in, in the kernel, and that actually gave us the ability to uh, do many of these sophisticated features that we want. In 2011, SystemD wrote nSpawn containers. Uh, they originally <coughs> were uh, created just to test SystemD, so they didn't have to reboot computers all the time uh, to just actually uh, test the, um, the init system. And why that gets interesting, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, so in 2013, Dot Cloud releases Docker. So Dot Cloud was used to be the company that uh, is now known as Docker Incorporated. They originally based their implementation on LXC. It has since been replaced by uh, libcontainer, um, and uh, and nowadays it's you know it's built on top of uh, Run C and Container D and those kinds of things. It's not it's not quite as uh, monolithic in nature. Um, so 2014, CoreOS releases Rocket. Uh, Rocket originally uh, was a implementation of their specification and their container image, uh, and it was built on top of SystemD and Spawn. And that was very interesting because then somebody took, uh, you know, what was originally kind of this primitive thing that added necessary state features to container technology and um, extended it to be more um, broad use case. And 2015, this was, so the history lesson kind of comes to a point here, is the Open Container Project, uh, now known as the Open Container Initiative, uh, is kind of a culmination of a lot of different technology, uh, technology companies out in the ecosystem coming together to try to standardize on um, container formats and runtime, such that uh, any, any person, company, open source community uh, project could build uh, a set of tooling or an implementation that would produce uh, container images and runtimes that could then run on any other implementation of the specification. So uh, 2015, Run C came out. This was the standalone tool for spawning containers in the OCP. This was donated to uh, the community by Docker, and uh, and then again in in 2016, more recently, Container D uh, again was was created as the thing that will allow you to run many Run C uh, tooling container implementation or container runtimes under uh, under that. So, if um, anyone's running uh, more modern versions of container, more modern versions of technologies, chances are you are running um, an OCI specified container image. And, uh, and it's just kind of being handled by various technologies under the hood. And, and those are the building blocks for what we 
get to now what we consider Linux containers. And uh, also Docker uh, being the de facto standard, uh, most popular uh, thing out in the ecosystem these days uh, for, for the build pipeline uh, at, at minimum and then beyond that. Um, many people are also using this as their runtime. Um, that is what uh, Fedora targeted originally from the community space. That's what our users are using. That's what users want. Um, and then uh, that's what the the build pipeline is most familiar with. And there's been a lot of really interesting tooling coming around that uh, you know ecosystem, not just Docker files specifically, but you know, Ansible container. There's there's the ability to build um, through uh, through Rockets. Uh, you know, core and rockets, AppC, and all these things. But because of the fact that they're all interchangeable, uh, thanks to the OCI, um, we have a lot of cohesiveness uh, in, in the ecosystem. So, uh, Docker being the most popular uh, one in Fedora's user space, this is what we target originally, and um, that's kind of where we're going to go from here. So, <clears throat> Docker uh, itself has a client server model. Uh, there is the Docker engine, which is the daemon. It's kind of single point of entry, has language bindings. Um, it, is a, it is an API that can be accessed locally or remotely. Uh, and, and this conceptually is a thing that we need to understand is that containers are instances of images. And this is very similar to how um, infrastructure as a service cloud environment have images and then instances of those images and you create instances based on an image. So in Docker space, images are built in a standard way using a Docker file. Um, and for Fedora's context, as well as many uh, Linux distributions, uh, there is SE Linux support upstream in Docker uh, that was provided by uh, Mr. Dan, Mr. Dan Walsh. Uh, he is uh, kind of known in the community as Mr. SE Linux. Uh, he has, has been kind of the curator of, of that for many, uh, for many years now. Um, so there's a lot of pluggable backends for isolation uh, beyond doing SE Linux sandboxing uh, and, and those kind of things, and, and that extends out to the, the uh, storage, uh, networking, and, and those kind of things. You can kind of change your backend for, uh, for what gives you, uh, what provides your, your storage location, your networking, those kind of things. So uh, conceptually, there is a difference between a base image and a layered image, and and that needs to be defined because what our build system that we're creating, that we've created, that is now available to Fedora uh, contributors, is is for layered images. So um, I'm sorry, I'm getting feedback. Somebody, somebody's uh, like bustling or something. Um, can we mute folks online? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, so container uh, container layered images uh, will basically be built by the greater community, and then a base image itself traditionally comes from the distribution, uh, much like the operating system releases are. So if you see um, like an ISO image to install an operating system uh, out in the out in the world, and and you download it and you install it, that is normally going to come from the project, the, the distribution project's uh, release engineering team. They're going to have a process in place that will send that through um, QA of some sort. <clears throat> they will go through validation. It will have, um, you know, a, a process put in place that, that you then have, you know, signed and verified. At arc, uh, I'm sorry, um, not archive. Um, Artifact. You'll have a signed, verified artifact that comes out. That's kind of the released entity. Well, the the base layer is uh, the the base image for uh, for Docker for containers in general is going to be very similar to that. Uh, that's something that you're going to see come from distributions uh, directly. And this is this is no different for Fedora. So we have a process internally within the release uh, team where the uh, base image already goes through Koji, it uses our, our internal build system, and, and that is produced, and then we actually uh, import that into a Docker registry and provide that for, uh, for community members. Whereas layered images, when you need to pull in um, some functionality, uh, oh, I just realized there. Yep, okay, I'm sorry. I just realized there's a typo on my slide. 
So in, in the center of that, you have a container, and then you, it says Fedora 25 base image. That's, let's say, Fedora 24 base image, such that the app layer and the base image would match one another. Um, bummer. OK. Um, <clears throat> so the idea behind this is that you have your base image, and your base image will provide your base runtime, much like your operating system does in a traditional environment. Um, <clears throat> so if you need application libraries and those kinds of things, you can add them. Well, we can start by having building blocks uh, for runtimes of dynamic programming languages or, um, or even just build uh, tooling for compiled languages. So we could have um, Python and Ruby and Node.js and PHP and all those things as a, as a layered image built on top of the base image. And then other images that would be built or for other software components for other you know, uh, services that need those things could then be built from them, and we can kind of cascade layer up, uh, providing more and more functionality as we go higher in the, the stack of layers. And the reason that we would want to do that is because it allows us to uh, kind of share some of those things, and we don't have to duplicate uh, storage for the base image. We don't have to duplicate the, the build and all those things. Um, on the end systems, we don't have to have that uh, carried multiple times. And, um, and it kind of just gives a, a, nice, a nice way of, of managing the relationship between the layers uh, instead of wanting to encapsulate all of that. And it also kind of leads back to the, uh, the microservice architecture, the idea that each container should do one thing uh, and, and provide only as much functionality as necessary to perform that one thing. So we're going to want to, um, uh, <clears throat> we're going to want to try and, and and mirror that along along the way the best we can. Did I lose? There we go. <clears throat> so, uh, just really quick, Docker file for those who aren't familiar. Uh, the first, the a Docker file is is kind of a uh, it's almost syntactic sugar on top of a shell script. Um, there's a handful of directives that are available, and they mean different things. But uh, at the end of the day, it has the flexibility of a of a you know shell script. You can do all kinds of things to uh, what becomes your container image via you know run stanzas, <clears throat> and those are going to just be shell commands that are executed uh, within the context of uh, a layer on the build. So the first line is from, and that's going to tell your image where to build from, and that's going to say that is going to be my base image that I build on top of. And your base image does not have to actually be a base operating system image it can, or a base distribution image. It can be another layer, so you can build on top of those layers. Um, so this one just start directly from Fedora. Um, and you can specify maintainers so something goes wrong. Somebody can look in the, the metadata and, and know where report issues and those kinds of things. And then we can actually run, uh, as part of the build process, we can run commands that will perform actions. Um, and th the, the items in all caps uh, are on the on the left are um, are kind of def defined predefined things. Uh, the Docker uh, project uh, documentation kind of explains those, and there's there's many more than what I've listed here. This is just a small example, um, <clears throat> and then we can add some startup scripts, and we can run actions on those, and then uh, ha provide a default command uh, entry point, and we can expose ports and those kind of things. You can also add uh, very interesting storage uh, things, and, and uh, there's just there's a lot of there's a lot that you can accomplish in a Docker file that will uh, provide a, a very nice default uh, setup and deployment. Also, there are kind of uh, wrapper programs out in the ecosystem that will use labels, so you can apply labels, uh, and there are wrappers out in the ecosystem that will use label data. Uh, to actually perform an action when you uh, run that container in a certain context. So uh, label data can be used uh, inside of OpenShift. So if you specify certain uh, labels, then actions can take place when, uh, when those containers, uh, images are used inside of OpenShift environment, similar with um, the uh, Atomic command line tool from Project Atomic, if you are to uh, do an atomic install of a containerized application. If it has, you know, certain specified label information, it will it will be actionable on those. So um, it's very flexible. It's very powerful. There's a lot you can do. 
Uh, but the main thing I want to point out here was the, the from line and, and the fact that all these uh, things will run inside of the context of uh, the the image itself that will, I'm sorry, yeah. So it creates a an instance of the image, uh, which will then run inside of a container, and then it will kind of be saved back. So um, <clears throat> you'll then Docker build, and you can just build this thing, and you uh, apply a tag to it. And tags are arbitrary strings. Um, and the tags are kind of two part. One is effectively the name, and then the other is ironically called the tag. Uh, <clears throat> so this is Fedora HPD, um, and then you could put a colon and then some tag. And that tag is kind of similar to a Git tag for anybody who's familiar with uh, Git versioning. However, the trick there is um, that it's it's common practice to change the these tags to change what you know what hash value they point to so um while that does happen sometimes in git it's generally frowned upon here it's it's common practice so uh, just note that the thing that a tag points to will uh, sometimes change uh, namely the latest so there's a special reserve tag called the latest tag and if you don't provide a tag uh it's just inferred so uh, i could have done this command at the top here, build t for hpd, colon latest, or just left it like this and it'll go the same. So uh, with our, our whirlwind tour of containers and Docker, let's move on to release engineering. <clears throat> what is release engineering? Uh, effectively, it's just making a software production pipeline that is reproducible, auditable, definable, and deliverable. Um, and just as a note, it should be automated to uh, the best of, of possibility. There's a very nice uh, formal ask, the most formal definition I was able to find um, by Boris Debick uh, from Google. And uh, I won't read that at you because it's a little bit lengthy, but uh, it's, it's, it's very well, uh, <clears throat> very well defined. And uh, if anybody's interested, uh, please feel free to, uh, to read that. Um, moving on, OpenShift. So OpenShift Commons, I assume everybody here is familiar with OpenShift, but uh, I like to kind of just run through this uh, for the sake of, of making sure that I've covered all of the bases uh, of, of the things that will go into our build system. So <clears throat> for those who are not familiar, OpenShift is an open source <clears throat> uh, contain container orchestration platform. And uh, there are two components, or I guess two main uh, pieces of the project. There is OpenShift Origin, which is the upstream community-led and, and community-powered uh, release of it. And then there's OpenShift by Red Hat, which is going to be um, the you know productized version and thing that people will uh, often run in, in their data centers and gives them uh, somebody to call if something goes bump in the night. Um, Fedora, being an open source project and, and entirely community based and community powers, we focus directly on OpenShift Origin and, uh, and we have participated upstream with OpenShift Origin as well as with their uh, installer, the uh, OpenShift Ansible installer, uh, for various things to try and, and make sure that we can enable uh, OpenShift Origin on Fedora. Um, so of this diagram, I want to focus <clears throat> directly on uh, the green section, uh, most notably on the left side, I guess second from the bottom, the build automation. This is the piece that we're really interested in. Um, oh, not yet, sorry. Um, so OpenShift has a concept of a build. There's kind of this primitive type, this REST API endpoint for a build and, and what that is. And um, there are different strategies for those builds. And one of those strategy types is custom. So for what we do in Fedora for layered image builds tooling is we provide a custom um, build strategy uh, so that we can define uh, how it will run, what it will run, the you know kinds of triggers or actions that it will respond to, those sorts of things. And uh, what's very, very powerful about this is that it uh, has given us um, as much flexibility as we ever could have asked for, as well as the ability to um, very, uh, very rapidly uh, scale our build infrastructure. So uh, once this is all set up at the point in which we decide we need more capacity, uh, thanks to the um, uh, OpenShift Ansible uh, playbook uh, repository, we just need to add a few 
uh, systems to our inventory file and re-execute our, our Ansible uh, playbooks, and then it's just done. Um, but what's really cool uh, is actually, <clears throat> so OSBS client is what defines that build uh, strategy custom type, uh, and it's, it's effectively um, a, a template for that build combined with a, a Python API uh, that lets us kind of tie that into a lot of other things. So for those not familiar, most of Fedora's infrastructure is written in Python. Uh, so we were uh, we were very grateful to have uh, have those kinds of things. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and go through a little bit, and then we're going to kind of round back to that. But uh, again, because this is the OpenShift Commons briefing, I suspect most people are familiar with with the next couple of slides. But we're just going to kind of run through them quickly. Uh, so OpenShift is um, again a can. Uh, container orchestration platform. It's built on top of Kubernetes. For those who didn't know, um, the, the mystery has been unveiled. Uh, so OpenShift participates heavily upstream with Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is the basis. Uh, OpenShift adds a lot of functionality on top of it for build pipelines, uh, CI integration, application lifecycle management, uh, those kinds of things. But at its at its very you know very broad overview, um, the main uh, infrastructure. Uh, architecture is very similar because of the fact that OpenShift is built on Kubernetes. So this is basically the breakdown. You have a client that talks to a master over REST API. Um, then the master has a schedule that talks to nodes. Your containers run inside of a thing called pods. Your pods are scheduled on nodes. Um, the details from there can cascade out in many directions, but that is, that is the base overview. Um, <clears throat> from there, um, oh, I kind of already talked about this, but uh, so OpenShift uh, built on top of Kubernetes. I should probably rearrange those two uh, slides. Uh, <clears throat> so as a bunch of advanced features, and, and the build component is what we are directly uh, interested in. Um, also very nice uh, REST API, command line interface, ID integrations, web UI, admin dashboard, those kinds of things. The triggers in the builds are very interesting to us because uh, right now um, we have uh, automated rebuilds happening. Um, or Sorry, automated rebuilds are being written uh, uh, upstream, uh, and, and we are going to use a combination of our custom build strategy and uh, OpenShift triggers to cause that to happen, and I'll explain a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. Um, so Docker Layered Image Build Service is built <clears throat> using a handful of components. Uh, so OpenShift Origin, which we just covered, uh, Atomic Reactor, which we'll cover in a minute, um, OSBS Client API, again, we Touch briefly, but we'll talk about it again in a minute. And then a registry, some registry of some sort, um, which is where um, we will have candidate images, stable updates, those kind of things. Um, in Fedora's implementation, we actually split this out. We have two registries. But um, <clears throat> the OSBS command line is how you would then talk directly to um, OpenShift. Um, a, again, because of those Python APIs and, and with our specified um, wrapper around um, this this custom build type, uh, I'm sorry, this custom build strategy uh, gives us the ability to then provide uh, a command line that allows end users who want to build um, container images a, a very focused entry point into uh, into the what has effectively become a build system um, by uh, by using these different pieces together. Atomic Reactor is is actually a a tool that allows you to build, and I'm uh, pretty sure. Oh, OK, so goes OSBS first, and then, all right, sorry. Um, so OpenShift build service, uh, so this is where we take advantage of the OpenShift uh, built-in primitive for the custom strategy. <clears throat> and we provide our, our templated build config that then gets populated by, by the OSBS client. Uh, we rely on OpenShift for all of our scheduling, um, build tasks. This is what I talked about earlier for scalability, those kinds of things. Whenever we want to expand, it's it's quite simple uh, that with the way that the, the whole system has been built. Um, <clears throat> this presents us with a defined component uh, to, to developers and builders. Um, the OSBS itself enforces the inputs. So this rounds back a little bit to the concept of release engineering and why we built the system this way instead of just kind of letting it be the wild west. Uh, so OSBS actually does uh, input sanitization and enforcement. Um, and Fedora's uh, Fedora system itself is even a little bit more locked down than the upstream OSBS, and, and I'll explain that a little bit as well. Uh, but <clears throat> we can we can say where the Git repo for the source file comes in, 
uh, the git commits and uh, all builds are centrally logged. Uh, and then the build root, uh, so inside of OSPS, the, um, each build happens on top of a build root Docker container. And what's, uh, what's very interesting about that is that is where Atomic Reactor runs, and I'll talk about Atomic Reactor uh, in a moment, but uh, Atomic Reactor actually performs the build itself, and Atomic Reactor has plugins and, and has uh, a lot of very interesting features, but uh, <clears throat> inside of the build route where the build actually happens, um, uh, that is firewall constrained. Uh, we can have unprivileged container runtime uh, with accidentally Linux enforcing, and the inputs are sanitized. So in the event that somebody was to try to, um, I don't know, curl, uh, for those familiar with uh, the curl command line utility on, on Unix style systems, uh, allows you to basically just grab um, uh, a URL and, and whatever's at the end of that URL. And, and a, a common paradigm uh, that's been floating around uh, for a bit is the idea that you should just curl some web URL uh, and uh, pipe its output directly to a shell um, and just do that as root, and that's your install process. Um, and that's fine. Uh, it's, it's fast, it's easy, and, and a lot of people have, have you know, had great success with that. The kicker there is from an auditable uh, tool chain aspect that's that's not an attribute we desire because what happens if that endpoint disappears so whatever that url was so let's just say um i don't know awesomeproject.io uh and if you do awesomeproject.io slash install and you curl that url and you pipe it to a shell and it runs and it does some things uh, number one we don't really have a good understanding of what those things it did unless we have somehow stored their install process script and whatever artifacts it installs somewhere uh, in the look aside cache or, or in some kind of an archive so that we can then audit it later. And then we have to version it and we have to almost try and police the internet. And that just gets unwieldy. So uh, for lack of a better term, we have kind of curated content such that it has been um, deemed uh, okay to use. And we have we already have that kind of audit pipeline that, that uh, that trail of, of uh, information about it and, and know that it's been, you know, uh, checked and patched against CVEs and all those, those kinds of things. So uh, we make sure that all in inputs are vetted. Um, so from there, uh, OpenShift image streams are used as uh, input sources for the builder. So when image streams get updated, uh, they're automatically pulled. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm reading a comment in the thing. Not as I'm cussing. Oh, cool. Okay. We might want, to, okay. We might, uh, sorry, there's a, a comment in the chat. Uh, somebody said that they don't have something quite as automated yet, but they are migrating. Uh, somebody for deployment of uh, MariaDB, ActiveMQ, and Unison, uh, which is uh, the name of their app. But um, it could be interesting to, to kind of chat about uh, approaches and see if, if maybe we can uh, share lessons learned and, and offer improvements to one another. Uh, okay, so from there, uh, utilizes OpenShift triggers to spawn rebuild actions. Uh, this is not yet in production, it's currently being developed, but we have the ability to um, set uh, trigger actions inside of OSPS such that if a layered image, so let's say the base image in our case would be Fedora, and let's say Fedora 25, which is our latest stable release, if we did a, an update to Fedora 25's base Docker image because glibc had some just messy security vulnerability, and we had to then <clears throat> issue an update for it. Well, inside of OSPS, it would notice, okay, hey, the base image was updated, then we should find out what layered images use that as a from field and then rebuild all of those and then take all of those and find out what layered images require those and rebuild all of those. So in on the back end of the system, you should be able to just update the anywhere, anywhere in the stack of, of layered images and it will just cascade rebuild those things so that next time when you're end users or your, your end uh, systems go to pull those images to get fully updated, um, a fully updated stack of layered, uh, layered images. 
uh, such that they're, they're, then their container instances when they're running are all, all completely patched and updated without the need to uh, go around and run DNF update all over the place. Uh, because effectively that, that gets done inside of the system. <clears throat> so uh, atomic reactor. So atomic reactor, I kind of alluded to slightly, but uh, it is it is very powerful single pass Docker build tool and <clears throat> it automates all kinds of things. I have a short list here. It does much more than this, but these are the kind of, uh, kind of big ticket items for what Fedora is using it for. Um, it allows you to push images to a registry when successfully built. You can inject YUM and DNF repositories inside the Docker file. Um, so if for any reason you need a custom repository that will provide um, the, the, the information it's looking for. So for Fedora's context, this is an internal local mirror of all of Fedora's repos. Um, whereas external users don't necessarily need that, but it's, it's the exact same content that's available on the public mirrors, but this is a system that is inside the protected network and, you know, the highly audited and, um, environment that the builds actually take place in. So that needs to be exposed into the Docker file some way, uh, into the build environment, but without the need for maintainers of Docker files to actually have to, um, supply that information and then figure out a way to remove those, those repositories at the end of their build process, those kinds of things. Uh, we can then change the, oh, we can also in similar fashion, change the base image from, uh, in your Docker file to, uh, whatever. And, and the idea there again is, uh, with internal registries, we can then allow people to keep public, public facing, uh, registries as their from, their from, uh, stanza. And then all that happens, basically the, the baseline URL is, is, uh, replaced on the internal. So, um, you can say from Fedora or from registry.fedoraproject.org slash Fedora, and then the internal, uh, registry inside the build system uh, is actually replaced or substituted and it's all the same because uh, we have we have checked some validation all the way through so we can we can verify that we are uh, we are using the right the right images that are, are also available externally um, uh, match uh, registry available inside that isolated uh, build root uh, run simple that's not supposed to be a new bullet point uh, and run simple tests after an image built uh, so in the event that, you know, an image is built, we can actually, uh, run tests, uh, internally with atomic reactor. And then also there's a, a, a lot of plugins available. I, I actually meant to put in a, a note about the plugins. Um, there's somewhere in the ballpark, I think 40 plugins currently available for atomic reactor. And all of that is, uh, specified, uh, which plugins to run is specified as part of the, uh, um, the templated. Uh, build specification for our our OpenShift uh, build a custom build strategy, and there's documentation on how to customize that. If you want to add a new plugin, you can add a new plugin and just change the config um, for uh, like site specific implementations of this without the need to actually uh, modify the global configuration of some of the things. Um, and so we can do gating of updates as well. Uh, this isn't an attribute of uh, atomic reactor, but this is an attribute of OSBS. So when builds are done, they land in effectively a candidate registry or a candidate uh, tag. Um, you can do either. It's just a configuration option. You just kind of tell the system if you want to have a, a tagging strategy or if you have uh, different uh, registries. So when the builds are done, they land in candidate registry, and then you can, at your discretion, uh, tag and, and move images around between different uh, registries. So Fedora's implementation, a little bit more complicated, uh, but that is because uh, we um, we add in a lot of different systems, and this is actually a somewhat stripped down version. Um, in at the end of my presentation, there's a there's a set of links, and in, in the the full the full picture one is there. And so basically, Fedora layered image maintainers uh, will interface with a thing called dist git. And for those familiar with how current RPM maintainers interact with Fedora, this will be very uh, this will seem very natural. And in the RPM standpoint, disk it is where you put your spec file and your patches and then your uh, checksum reference uh, to the, the source code that you use and the source code is uploaded to a look side cache and then referenced inside of the build system. 
Um, <clears throat> and to build an RPM, you would issue the command fed package build. Well, in the uh, instance of, of containers, we will have our Docker file inside of disk git. We'll have our service and its scripts, those kinds of things, tests, documentation. And then we will do a fed package container build. And much like RPM builds happen in Koji, the container builds will then happen in Koji, ex with the exception that container builds technically don't happen in Koji. There's a, a functionality in Koji called content generators. And that means that any external system can actually generate the actual content. Uh, however, there's a metadata requirement. There's a specification uh, of what information must be provided such that Koji uh, will then know uh, all, of, all of the information required to rebuild that artifact that it then stores, that is then re-imported. Because in the event that OSBS were to somehow disappear off the planet, um, we could reinstall it and then use that metadata uh, as input back into OSBS and rebuild and get uh, the same thing, uh, the same resulting image in uh, so much that we can actually audit it and say it contains the same things that it, that it did before. Um, <clears throat> so we will do our builds via Koji. Koji will then schedule them in OSBS. OSBS will do the build. And um, you'll notice two arrows going up out of OSBS to the registry and to Koji. Koji will store the single file representation flattened uh, version of that image. Uh, OSBS will uh, also upload the resulting image to our registry implementation. And like I mentioned before, Fedora has two registries. We have registry.fedoraproject.org and candidate-registry.fedoraproject.org. Um, both of them are publicly available. Um, it's just that the candidate uh, image candidate registry is where um, images land as soon as they're done building, so that they can immediately be tested and immediately be downloadable by the uh, the broader community if they want to participate in the testing. And then uh, once validated, they are moved over to the stable and we'll release them. So um, just git, so distro git, each branch is a Fedora release. Um, also in the future that will be known as uh, Fedora Generational Core as we move towards the uh, Fedora modular Modularity uh, project and, and that kind of grand vision of, of breaking the, the operating system down into something more modular. Um, and, and also to note, uh, modules will be distributed in, uh, in multiple ways. One of those ways will actually be uh, container images. So this system will be used to produce those things that will um, kind of become core building blocks of, of the next generation of Fedora. Um, so Fed Package, it's a Fedora package and maintainer helper tool, uh, manage the disk it branches, initiate the builds, those kinds of things. Koji, so I mentioned before, Koji's authoritative build system, live USB images, DVD ISOs, everything, everything is built in here. Um, and then now we're now we're adding the container builds. Uh, Koji Container Build is a plugin to Koji that allows us to orchestrate the builds uh, between Koji and OSBS. And then uh, I will maybe make a, ra a rash assumption that everybody here knows what a Docker registry is, but it is um, just the, the upload, download, destination, and point of distribution for uh, Docker container images. Uh, so um, we'll quickly do questions, and if there are not many of those, or if we have enough time, I'll also do a quick uh, demo. Righty, uh, I'm, I'm not seeing any real questions in the chat room here. Um, folks, if you would like, I will unmute you all. And um, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and do that. So I'm thinking maybe run through your, well, there, my goodness. Could you have more references? I don't think so. You might um, get. No, them. actually, I do. I think I think my references page is a little bit outdated. Uh, my newer my newer one has a second column, um, <laughs> but I will I will happily make this available in PDF format. If anyone right. Yes. Send, send me the PDF. Absolutely. And I'll attach it to the blog post with all of this. Um, I'm I'm not seeing or hearing any questions. Uh, I'm just unmuting everybody. Um, so why don't you run through your demo um, because we're getting close to the end of the hour. Okay. Let me unshare. They can ask a question. Great. Okay, I just a moment. I'm sorry. I'm changing. Uh, let me change a couple things around. Do, 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 copy. Okay. All right. 
let me go ahead and share this terminal. Okay, can everybody see a terminal? Yes, and I love the font size. Good, okay, that was my follow-up question, is how's the font size? Because um, it, is, it is very large on, <laughs> on my screen. I was hoping it would be good enough for, uh, for folks on the video. Okay, um, so if you notice my, my current path, it's in my, uh, my home directory. I have, I have a layout for Fed Package because Fed Package is now namespace. Um, so, uh, so if I actually, I'm sorry, disk git is now namespace, but I executed it. And I probably should name that directory disk git now I think about it. Anyways. Um, so if we go ahead and remove uh, this directory, and if I did a fed package clone docker um, cockpit, um, this will get uh, the cockpit uh, disk repository um, from the docker namespace because uh, there is also the RPM namespace. So we will just go ahead and clone that really quick. <clears throat> and now we have a uh, cockpit. And uh, for those not familiar, um, I'll show what cockpit is in a minute uh, when we go over to my web browser. Um, we love our the cockpit. Yes, I, I'm a big fan. It's it's uh it's very cool. Oh, I went to the GitHub page and not uh, yeah, it's that nope, nope, nope. Okay. That are pre-staged. Okay, so in here uh, you will find um, we have our atomic install, atomic run, atomic uninstall, and um, these are just small scripts that do things for uh, the atomic command. Uh, for uh, like I mentioned before, it is a wrapper, and uh, there's also a Docker file. So if we just go ahead and dim and look at the Docker file, or any editor of your choosing, I uh, use whatever you find productive in. Um, there's a handful of things you'll notice here. <clears throat> First off, we have um, our Bugzilla component because we need to know where to find this thing in Bugzilla. Uh, and uh, we have our name. Uh, so you'll notice something interesting about the name. There's FGC, and that is Fedora Generational Core. And that uh, is also, so that is actually inherited from the parent image. So this is something that we have in our Fedora guidelines for container images. Uh, and that is how we namespace those things in our registry. And then also uh, we'll provide context for um, what the base underlying uh, Fedora generation or Fedora release that you know this, this correlates to. Um, then we have our version, which is then pulled from that environment variable, our release, which is you know half pulled from uh, the release environment variable, and then the other half from the disk tag. Again, disk tag is inherited by the, uh, the base image. Um, and for those familiar with building RPMs, this is the same idea. It's just that Docker does not have a mechanism similar to RPM macros, so we kind of just uh, Kind of move things around and, and implement it with environment variables, and then apply it to labels so that it's it's persistent with uh, with the metadata uh, that Docker carries around with the with the image in the end, because we can then use that. So um, <clears throat> you will see here we have you know some uh, we take the atomic install, uninstall, and run, and, and add them into the container. And then we have labels that, that do something with that uh, in the end. And that label and its data are then told to the atomic command. Um, so we are going to, as this evolves in the Fedora project, we are going to uh, develop guidelines around um, adding functionality for both the atomic wrapper command as well as, uh, as, well as OpenShift. Because um, from the standpoint of enabling containers on the system, uh, atomic install is, is the direction we want to go. But, um, from enabling containers in a, in a scaled environment, OpenShift is, is kind of the, the direction that Fedora as a project is going as, as you know, a fellow open source project that, that we are working as much as we can with upstream. Um, so we'll, we'll see a little bit more of that unfold as we move forward. But those, uh, those labels are able to actually kind of coincide with one another because there's no naming conflicts or anything like that. They just just all in stride. We gotta gotta get it get it done as we're able to. So, anyways, um, so we can make edits to this, uh, and then let's just you know, bump it at least a little bit, and then we can do fed package commit uh, bump release for for demo build package. So, 
Slash. And then we can set package container build. This will schedule it out there. And this will take anywhere from, I don't know, two to five minutes to run, depending on how intensive a task it's doing. Uh, however, I already did one up here just uh, so that I already would have it done. Uh, so I ran the set package container build. It created this task. Um, then we watched it. And then in the end, we popped out with uh, a Koji build uh, metadata import as well as a set of repositories that I can be accessed from. <clears throat> and you'll notice there's there's many. And the reason for that is we want to allow users to have as much granularity as they want. So the first one is a unique identifier, and that is purely used uh, in the sense uh, of um, iterative testing uh, for for every single build, and not necessarily builds that could be candidates for release, but every single build. Uh, so we have a, a, an idea inside the, the system called a scratch build, and that's effectively a throwaway build. It doesn't need an actual version applied to it, but we need a build in so we can test it. Um, it will only be given, it will only be given this, uh, this label, or I'm sorry, this tag in the repository, um, and it, it will not receive any of the other ones, but this one here. And all of these are live. I mean, if anybody cares to type this out in your command line, you can, you can go ahead and Docker pull these, these images now and, and play with them. Um, so <clears throat> then we have uh, the full uh, version uh, release and disk tag uh, identifier, and that is for testing uh, the actual uh, release candidate builds. We want to make sure identify them all the way down to uh, release number and those kind of things. And then we have major release identifier, uh, or I'm sorry, major version identifier without the release. So if somebody out in the ecosystem uh, just cares about what, you know, release version, or, uh, I'm sorry, version number 125, but is not concerned with what release of that. So it doesn't, they're not really worried about whatever patch level it's on, but they want the latest of that version, no matter what, um, then they can uh, reference reference that. Um, and then uh, the latest is just the default. You, you want the latest version release of whatever this component is that is being uh, distributed as a um, as a uh, document. So we will, you know, for grins, just go ahead and do, uh, let's do full. Oh, that did not copy. That's cool. Where am I? Three, three, three. Docker pull. Two. Yay, we're getting data. Um, okay. So really quick, I will go into, I'm going to switch really quick to my web browser. Okay, pretty sure it wants tiny. So, um, <clears throat> so real quick, I said I mentioned what the Cockpit project is. It is a, it's a very pleasant uh, web UI that gives you all, all kinds of fun uh, functionality and and nice graphs and metrics and things to interact with your your Linux systems. It can manage um, containers. It can manage system storage. It can manage container storage. You can actually inter interact with uh, networking, and um, I think you can actually do uh, application uh, scale that application deployment on both Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, for those kinds of things. If you have a pre-existing application that you want to deploy, um, so that's very cool. Uh, I highly recommend everybody check it out. Um, but I think we need to get a, um, a briefing on that soon, sometime soon. I mean, 2016, okay. we'll get that one. Yeah, let's uh, let's look in. Yeah, we should schedule that. Cool. Um, so this is Fedora's build system, koji.fedoraproject.org, if anybody's not familiar. Um, so really quick, do, 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 do. there we go. Um, <clears throat> so state closed, build container. Um, so this is the parent task, and the reason that there's a parent and child task is because right now today we're only targeting x86-64 processor architecture because that is primarily what uh, upstream Docker 
and uh, most OCI compliant runtimes target directly. However, we uh, do produce uh, alternative architecture base images uh, in Fedora. We will later be uh, adding more uh, architecture um, more architectures to to this as well, um, namely PowerPC and ARM. Uh, ARM both 32-bit uh, uh, ARM v7 and uh, ARM uh, AAR64. So that's that's something that um, we aim to target there. So each build will actually happen uh, on on all supported architectures later in life, and that's why there's a parent and then child. Okay, so we'll go ahead and, um, oh, really quick, show results. This is what we saw there, our list of um, <clears throat> repositories and, uh, and that kind of thing. So we'll go ahead and go into the create container. And uh, this will, again, give us our results, repositories, those kind of things, task ID. Um, but the uh, OpenShift incremental log, uh, and the reason it's title incremental is it is actually updated incrementally. You can tail it in the web browser, and it'll kind of scroll and offset and those kind of things. Uh, but this is the the log file, and it's very verbose, and it's very verbose on purpose. Um, and uh, so I'll just kind of slowly scroll through here. And I don't expect anybody on uh, the video to uh, either fully understand what the log file is telling you or necessarily be able to read it because uh, it's a lot of text. It's scrolling relatively quickly, but uh, the idea is just that we have a lot of information. And we'll notice here, uh, this is our uh, Docker file that uh, we saw earlier, except uh, it, here we have the SHA sum. So like I said earlier in the presentation that we actually do checksum verification during the build, uh, that's what's being done here. So we are, we are doing checksum verification instead of just pulling from some arbitrary named uh, URL. Um, and then here you see it's actually doing the install portion. The, you know, this here should be pretty familiar for anybody who's done a, a yum install or a DNF install of a package on an RPM based system. And then all of the, uh, the plugins down here run and it's doing fun stuff. Okay. So uh, very robust logging, uh, incremental log. So if something goes wrong, you can find out what it was. When it's all said and done, you also have a link to this. And this is our uh, content generator metadata import. And this is what gives us uh, kind of the round back to the release engineering concept of, of allowing us to actually uh, audit and verify these things. Uh, so technically this doesn't have RPMs because it's our archive or it's artifact that comes out as a tarball. Um, but we can actually go into the info of this tarball. <clears throat> uh, and that tarball actually, if you download it, uh, you can do a Docker uh, import and it, it will give you a resulting image, but the name of the image will uh, be with, uh, with a checksum on it. So this, this is all the information about it. So this is all kinds of information about um, <clears throat> the layers involved, their checksums, the uh, Git URL that it came from, the Git hash that was used, those kinds of things. So we can actually verify uh, where the inputs came from. Here's the list of files included, as well as install RPMs. So right now today, the only things that Fedora allows into uh, container images are RPMs. We hope to expand that later, but we need to find a, a good way to curate um, all sorts of other content, uh, you know, Ruby gems, um, pip installs, peckles, pairs, Node.js, NPM, everything. Uh, and, and we just need to find a good way to kind of curate that content so we can we can have a, a trusted, verified source of those things instead of um, just kind of opening the floodgates to the internet. But uh, we have this manifest, so we can go through this manifest, and <clears throat> you'll see this is 1 through 50 of 178. So there are 178 RPMs installed in, in that image. And what's great about this is it allows us the ability to go back, and if we need to, we can recreate a repository with just these packages and then rebuild this image from the checksums in the previous pages metadata and reproduce the exact same image such that we can verify and audit everything that goes into it um, in the event that we ever needed to. And uh, that, in a nutshell, is the demo. Awesome. That, in a nutshell, is a lot to digest. And 178 RPMs is a lot of RPMs. So <laughs> it's phenomenal what goes into these things. So I think we've reached the end of our hour. Yeah, um, I, I ran over by one minute. I apologize. That's OK. And we started two minutes late. So it's actually right dead center on time. So you did a oh, great, great. 
And I, I'll, um, for those of you who are listening, I will grab the slides from him and post this um, in blog.openshift.com shortly, probably not until after the Christmas shutdown break holiday thing that we do here at Red Hat. Um, we'll be back the first week of January, and I think that's when our, our blog web editor um, will have this up and running. But um, I'll make the, the video available to you guys um, privately in case you want to review this over your holiday break, because, you know, it is the night before Christmas kind of reading here. Um, so thank you so much, Adam, for, for doing this today. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some discussion about how other people are implementing their build services and seeing if we can learn from each other and make um, some best practices around this and maybe even have them reuse some of the work or just use the work that you guys are doing in Fedora land. So thanks again and um, we really appreciate you taking the time today and have a great holiday. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you. And uh, I would love to uh, get conversations going because definitely in, in the world of best practices about this stuff, it's still evolving. Yeah. And there's a lot to digest here. So thanks again. And we'll see you all in the new year.